Good morning. I'm Pastor Scott. Glad you're here. I don't think anybody mentioned, so if you see this over here, we didn't actually host uh, like a high school uh, prom. What we did is we had a volunteer appreciation dinner on Friday night, and so if you volunteer here in any way and you didn't get an invitation, my sincerest apologies for not making sure you got the invitation, but we wanted to leave it up really to say, hey, there's a great chance to serve in our church. There's lots of places that we could use people to fill in places, and, uh, and we do appreciate you. So we took the time on Friday night to actually spend some time and just thank people. And we had a lot of fun playing some different games and hopefully had good food. I was kind of the cook, so hopefully the food was good. And uh, yeah, well, thank you. All right, so I just want to explain that. We are going through our continuing study here of the book of Thessalonians, first book to start with. And I always want to do a little bit of a setup, especially if you haven't been here, just a quick uh, summary of what's going on. So this is one of the earliest books that Paul wrote, letters that Paul wrote to a church. He wrote it to the church at Thessalonica, and he established the church there first in his second missionary journey. He came along, established the church. He kind of got driven out, or didn't kind of, he really got driven out because of persecutions, and he left the church behind without really feeling like he was able to communicate all that he wanted to tell them about how to live for Christ. Okay? And so he's out, and he, as we talked about a few weeks ago, he sent Timothy back because he's really concerned. He spends a lot of time praying about this church and wondering how they're doing. He sends Timothy, his faithful companion, back to the church to find out how they're doing, and then he came back with a good report, and he was so, so happy, so pleased to hear that for the most part, the church was doing really well, and from that position, he kind of opens up what we have here in, uh, in chapter 3 and 4 of trying to say, now that I know you're good, let me tell you how to really live a life that is well-pleasing to the Lord. And so last week we covered the first nine verses of chapter 4, and a key verse in that section is 4.3, where it says, this is the will of God, your sanctification. And so if you were here last week, you probably remember some of that. We'll do a quick review here in a little bit. But he's talking about our sanctification, and so I titled last week, Sanctification Part 1, and Sanctification Part 1 was Paul giving a quick synopsis of what not to do. If you want to live, sanctification means being set apart, being holy, being righteous, being more like God than more like a sinful person. And so he wrote them and said, this is God's will for you. Every single person, every believer for sure, he wants our sanctification to be more like him and less like the flesh and the sinful life that we came out of. And we got a little personal. We got a little bit, you know, in your face a little bit, <clears throat> in all of our faces a little bit. Because he then goes on to talk about sexual immorality. He talks about the way we're supposed to live sexually in purity before God. And there is a way to do it, <clears throat> and there's lots of ways not to do it. We talked about that last week. This week, we're going to transition just a few verses, but we're going to talk about what to do, not what not to do. Sometimes we kind of throw around terms like the sins of commission, committing things he told us not to do, and sins of omission, failing to do what he's commanded us to do. This is the second section. We're going to talk about things that in a sanctification process, in a life that God calls to be sanctified, that we would in fact do certain things that reflect him, that are like God in character and in nature. And so, This is the second part. If you didn't catch the first one, you can catch it online or get notes and things like that. In your scriptures, wherever you brought them with, in a hard copy Bible, which is a great way to have it because if electronic things go away, you still have a hard copy to carry with you forever. But if you got a phone or a device or you want to look on our screens, let's start in verse 9 of 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. So Paul writes, After talking about what not to do, especially in certain areas like sexual immorality, Paul says, but concerning brotherly love, you have no need that I should write to you, for you yourselves are taught by God to love one another. Sorry. (laughs) And indeed, you do so toward all the brethren who are in Macedonia. But we urge you, brethren, that you increase in that brotherly love, more and more. 
that you also aspire to lead a quiet life, to mind your own business, and to work with your hands as we commanded you, that you may walk properly towards those who are outside and that you may lack nothing. Okay. So lots of stuff here to cover. And I will just go ahead and tell you right up front, if, you, if you're looking at the notes on your devices or in your hand from the bulletins, we got a lot to cover. And, and you know, last week I tried to give you four specific points about what you should really think about in this life of sanctification and how we're supposed to not do certain things that God has told us to do or how we're supposed to protect ourselves in those areas. This one is pretty dense, I'm going to admit. I'm not probably expecting anybody to memorize every point that's in these, are in these notes. But if you can walk away with certain key ideas, concepts, and things to apply, you will do really well. Okay. And of course, you can take your notes home and, and pray and contemplate those things as we go. But the big one that jumps off the verses at us right here is a commandment, as he says, you've been taught by God about brotherly love. Paul taught them, apparently when he was there, about brotherly love. And God himself has taught us what brotherly love looks like. Okay. So this is part of this sanctified life. As I said, sanctification is more than not doing what is immoral. We certainly shouldn't engage in immoral actions. I hope everybody in principle agrees with that. But sanctification is also challenging believers to manifest God's character in everything that we do. We're to manifest his character. We call it crucifying the flesh and living and walking in the spirit. It's a challenge every single day. I don't know any person who goes, yeah, I've, I've attained, I've arrived, I have no problems with walking in the spirit. It's a process and it's a challenge every day, I believe, to crucify the flesh, how it normally wants to respond in any given situation, and to say, no, I choose to walk with God. I choose to follow what he has called me to be. It's be more like him and how I respond and act in the things that I do. So, yes, don't do certain things when you think about church. You go, oh yeah, that's that church. They always tell you what not to do. Well, we also can instruct on how to be a godly follower of Christ, be more like Christ in doing the things he's called us to. Brotherly love certainly falls into that. But I'll, I will remind you, uh, if you were here last week or watching online or whatever, of these four points. I just want to cover them again really, really quick. So 1 Thessalonians 4, 3, this is the will of God, your sanctification. That's God's will. Now we all know what God wants for us. It's the same for every person, and his love compels him to drive us towards a place where we're more like him, because he's perfect, so why not try, aspire to be more like a perfect God? And then we get that because Jesus himself, in his high priestly prayer in John 17, says, sanctify them with your truth. Your word is truth. We can't be any close to sanctified in our life, in our conduct, if it's not built on the foundation of the absolute authority of God's word. So God's will is that we're sanctified. God's will is that we treasure his word in our hearts so that we do not sin against him, which is the next one. Right? In Psalm 119, 11, the psalmist writes, you know, God, I've hidden, I've treasured your word in my heart. So it's always there. Man Government systems, whoever can steal the word of God from us. They can burn them, they can outlaw them, they can change our devices so they say things that God didn't actually write. But no one can take what God has allowed us to treasure in our hearts beforehand. And those things ought to, in every situation of life, at work, at home, at the gas pump, at the grocery store, wherever it is, those treasures that we've stored in our hearts ought to compel us to live a sanctified life. And then finally, of course, 1 Peter 1.16, quoting from various places in the Old Testament, Peter says that we are called to be holy, or be sanctified as well, but be holy because God is holy. Those four points, if you didn't catch all the meaning behind them, you can go back, as I said, from last week. But those are great points about the sanctification doctrine that we're called to live by. But here, let's transition now to today, this set of verses here in 
verses 9 through 12, brotherly love of sanctification. This is real special. Philadelphia, brotherly love is where we get that term. The city of brotherly love, named after this concept. Brotherly love, special kind of love, is a love of sanctification that I believe always involves a sacrifice of the heart and the will. Sacrifice. That means we love when we have to sort of go, it would be easier not to love. It would be easier to react in anger. It would be easier to go, my pride has been stepped on. I was wronged. I was this. I was that. It requires some kind of sacrifice. Because if you think about it, if some of us had people who followed us around everywhere and they just said, oh, Scott, I love everything you do and everything you say, and there's a, you know, they're just never-ending praise and just want to follow everywhere I go, it's not hard to love that person, right? But is that really love, to love them because they're loving me, right? What's hard is whether it's your spouse or whether it's your child or whether it's some person you have some kind of social connection to through work or other things, and they're really great on your nerves. They really make it hard. They're really a, a, a cantankerous person. And you go, no, I'm going to sacrifice how I would respond in the flesh, and I'm going to respond in love to that person. I'm going to sacrifice the things that I feel, sacrifice the things that my nature tells me I should respond in, and go, how would God respond to this person? Of course, God would speak the truth to them in love, but God always wants the very best for every person. And when we're in those situations, do we really want the very best, or are we more like, my flesh demands that I get satisfaction for how I've been mistreated? for how I've been wronged, for how I was misunderstood, for how they didn't treat me the way I was expecting to be treated. Love of sanctification always requires a sacrifice. It's not about what we get out of it. It's about what we get to give from God's position of love. That's the sanctified love that we have. We should be in relationship with one another, certainly starts at the most close and interpersonal relationships we have with our spouse, with our children, with our family, that should then certainly spread into the church, right, where we recognize, I may not have anything in common per se with this person, or this person, every time I talk to them, my blood pressure kind of boils up a little bit. What a great opportunity to say, I choose sanctification rather than my flesh always involves a sacrifice. And we recognize that this comes from the heart of our Father God. There's lots of descriptions about who God is, but one of our favorites ought to be God is love. Not God loves, not God sometimes offers love to certain people. No, God is love. And love has lots of components, lots of aspects to it. Everything we see God do from Genesis 1 to Revelation 22 is in, care, in representation of his love for the world. And, but he also loves righteousness. He also loves holiness. He also loves those things where he demands that we live in a certain way, and he hates lawlessness. He hates unrighteousness. So, you can't have love without also having the opposite of recognizing certain things must be spoken of as wrong, like sexual immorality we talked about last week, and yet God loves the person enough to tell them, I don't want you to live that way. I want you to live in a way that more reflects my character. Okay. So God is love. We find that in 1 John 4. Now, sometimes when I talk about the love chapter, we would say 1 Corinthians 13 is the love chapter. But honestly, John 4, 1 John 4 really, really comes close to actually fully defining the kind of sanctified love that we, sure, we are all called to live as. So let's take a look. I'm gonna, this is kind of an extended passage. It's a, a little bit of a detour. Paul said, you already know what God's brotherly love commandment looks like. Now, he said that to the Thessalonians 2,000 years ago. I think we need a refresher course. Right? We need a little bit of refresher on what it really means to have a love like God. So in your scriptures, wherever you have them or on screens, 
1 John 4, verse 7. John writes, Beloved, let us love one another, for love is of God, and everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. He who does not love does not know God. He who does not love does not know God, for, he, for God is love. In this, love of God was manifested towards us. In this, the love of God was manifested toward us, that God sent his only begotten son into the world, that we might live through him. In this is love, not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. No one has seen God at any time. If we love one another, God abides in us, and his love has been perfected in us. By this, we know that we abide in him, and he in us, because he has given us of his spirit. And we have seen and testified that the Father has sent the Son as Savior into the world. Whoever confesses that Jesus is the Son of God, God abides in him and he in God. And we have known and believed the love that God has for us. God is love, and he who abides in love abides in God, and God in him. Love has been perfected among us in this, that we may have boldness in the day of judgment. Because as he is, so are we in this world. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear, because fear involves torment. But he who fears has not been made perfect in love. We love him because he first loved us. If someone says, I love God and hates his brother, he is a liar, for he does not love his brother, who, if he does not love the brother whom he has seen, how can he love God whom he has not seen? And this commandment we have from him, that he who loves God must love his brother also. Whoever believes that Jesus is the Christ is born of God. And everyone who loves him who begot also loves him who is begotten of him. By this we know that we love the children of God, when we love God and keep his commandments. For this is love, that we keep his commandments. And his commandments are not burdensome, for whatever is born of God overcomes the world. And this is the victory that has overcome the world, our faith. Who is he who overcomes the world but he who believes that Jesus is the Son of God? All right, as I said, it's a long passage, but you see John making some very bold, very direct, very inescapable statements about our conduct in this area of brotherly love. I want to cover some of those. So first, we said, God is love. It's who he is. It's his character. His entire nature is born out of his love. He created us because he loves us. He sent his son to die for us because he loves us. He wants to spend eternity with us by faith, our faith in him, because he loves us. God is love, and it's a genuine love that comes from him. All genuine love really can only be born out of God. It is impossible for someone to say, I hate God, but I love man. It's also impossible for somebody to say, I love God, but I hate man. Right? It's, these things are incompatible. All genuine love has to draw from the source that is God himself. Now, believers, I believe, are to have a maximum expression of what we kind of refer to as an undefeatable love for others. You step on my toe today, and you step on my toe tomorrow, and you step on my... You keep doing the same thing over and over and over again to me. You know what an undefeatable love is? I still love you. I keep encouraging you to do the right thing. I keep speaking the truth in love. But I love you even though it hurts me, even though it's painful to keep enduring. But God keeps enduring with us, doesn't he? How many times have we had a sin that we go, God, I hate to come before you again, 
and tell you that I've done the same thing that I did yesterday and the day before and the day before and the day before and all, all those days, does God ever say, I'm tired of allowing and extending my forgiveness to you or my love to you? That's how God's love is. That's how our brotherly love is called and commanded that we extend that same kind of love to one another. Not compromising truth, never compromise truth, but it, we speak the truth in love. We communicate to brothers in love, not in uh, some kind of fleshly response that our nature would normally sort of drive us towards. So, John writes that those who refuse to love others do not know God. Let those words sink in. Those who refuse to love others do not know God, nor do they love God. We're just fooling ourselves if we think that we can love God and know God if we can't reflect him, if we can't reflect his love and extend it to others. Personal challenge to me and to everyone here. Think back over our lives and say, am I loving people the way God has asked me to love them? Not even asked, he commanded me to love them. Think back about this morning. Maybe you had an argument with a spouse or a child or somebody else already in church. Think back, how did God want me to respond? Do I need to do something in response to how I've treated someone or failed to treat them properly. And if it wasn't this morning, then go back to yesterday. Go back this week. That might be enough. You kinda, I gotta fix things that I didn't really actually show and extend love to somebody else in. And if, you're, if you feel comfortable with this week, then go back the month. And kinda go back in life, try to keep a short record, a short account, and try to get things resolved with people and extend the kind of love. Ask yourself, I gotta ask myself, how does God want me to extend love to that person? I don't get to participate in the decision. God gets to define how I love people. God defines how you love people. Go back over again and again and again and ask God, where do I need to build, restore and rebuild some relationships? Now I know sometimes that's not possible. Sometimes somebody's died. They've moved on, you have no ability to contact them. Well, lift up in that person in the spirit to the Lord and ask the Lord for favor and for wisdom on what to do next. Others, and I have some people in my life, you know, believe it or not, I you know, kind of hope that I'm a nice guy, but I've had people in my life that basically have, you know, one way or another said, don't ever contact me again for whatever reason. It's usually church related, but it is. I mean, it's just, unfortunately, it's just that, you know, you get into these things and they're just like, I cut you off, don't ever, you know, delete your number, don't want to have any contact with you. Okay, you've established that boundary, I'll respect that. But it doesn't mean I can't have an intercession for that person between me and the Holy Spirit, right? So as much as possible, I want to know God, and knowing God and loving God demands that I show brotherly love to others. It's not romantic, doesn't mean, have anything to do with feelings or emotions, it has to do with wanting the very best for that person. The very best for that person. And even if it means a sacrifice to me, I'm going to enrich their life by showing the kind of love that God has shown to me as much as I can extend it to another person. And God is, God's love is the standard by which all believers must live by. We don't get to define what love is on our own. We get to see how God has loved. Again, speaking the truth in love, bringing condemnation where condemnation and rebuke needs to be made. Certainly those occasions permit themselves. But how does God show love? What is that standard? Before any one of us ever accepted Christ, we were sinners. And what does scripture say? That he loved us so much, he died for us while we were yet sinners. While we were enemies, he died for his enemies. Right? That's the kind of love. You don't have to say, well, I'll love them as soon as they A, B, C, D, E. You say, I'll love them, and I sure pray that they will A, B, C, and D, and E, if that's appropriate in God's definition of love. God's love provides the standard by which we must live our lives in love by. A few things, a few points on that. 
God sent his only begotten son, his, and it really means one and only, the best translation of that is not only begotten like he birthed the Savior, Jesus Christ, Mary did in, in the flesh, but Jesus Christ is eternal. So it's his one and only son. In the Godhead, Jesus Christ, the one and only son, he sent him to suffer and to die so that sinners, people who transgressed against God, people had no relationship with God the way he wanted to have a relationship with them, he sent his son to suffer and die. We all know they were standing before the cross saying, crucify him, crucify him, give us Barabbas, all of these things. They spit on him, they tore his clothes, they beat him, they nailed his hands and feet to a cross. And he, what did he do? Didn't he say, Father, forgive them, for they don't know what they do? And the only way that forgiveness is actually possible is if he shed his blood all the way to the point of death to die for them. Well, there's a standard. Maybe we're not called to die for somebody, but maybe we are. Because no greater love, there's no greater love than this than to lay down our life for a brother, lay down our life for someone else, even if they hate us. It's easy to die for the person you love most. You know, if you're going to die, stand, you know, men, you're supposed to walk on the outside of the sidewalk so that if the car comes up and hits you, you're the one who gets hit, not your wife. Okay? That's easy because hopefully you love your spouse. But dying for that person who, who swore that they were going to destroy your life, you step in front of the car, the bullet, and you take it for them, that's what Christ did for every one of us. It's what we're called to do to love others. God loved ungodly sinners who were previously only in darkness. I think we've covered that. So Jesus Christ became what he calls the propitiation, kind of a satisfactory ransom payment, God says sin requires justice. Justice requires a payment for sin. The only acceptable payment for sin is a perfect blood death sacrifice. Only Jesus Christ could be that sacrifice. So he's the propitiation for our sins. He paid a price that we can't pay. God was fully satisfied with his death, burial, and resurrection, which allows you and I to have eternal life in Christ. But that's the kind of love that he sent his son for. So since God loved the world enough to suffer and die for the ungodly, believers ought to love one another in response. If we don't have to actually lose our life to extend love to others, praise the Lord. But we ought to take some action in the category of love. We ought to really, truly seek love for others. And again, this is not romantic. It's not about you know, even being friends, you know, and, and hanging out every Saturday or playing games or going to the lake or this or the other. I mean, that's stuff. But love is, I want the best for you. I want to do what I can to see you be successful, even if it's a sacrifice in my own life. Certainly, God did that for us. And John gives us a couple of tests here. The whole book of First John is a bunch of tests. But the test here is this. All of us are called to kind of compare ourselves to the standard in this test. Love for others demonstrates God's presence in us. If we have one person or a hundred people or a billion people that we can't love, then John tells us the love of God isn't in us. That's a hard statement. That ought to compel us to evaluate every relationship we have. Can we extend love? Are we extending love? Because John says the te first test of God's love being present in us is that we love others. Love for others demonstrates that we are in relationship with God and not a fantasy or a fiction of who God is. We, may, we, we invent this idea that he's happy with me because blah, 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 blah. But I still have these people over here. Maybe I should point this way. I, you know, I don't want to put anybody in the room here. Some people over here that I hate, right? That, if I have that thought in my mind, I better have a thought in my mind, am I really in relationship with God at all? I know it's by faith. I know that's what we're called to do. I'm not trying to be a heretic here. Just saying we, we believe in God, and by faith we have a relationship with him. But it doesn't end with a confession of faith. It begins with a confession of faith. 
And then we got to take inventory and an analysis of how we're living our lives to continue to prove over and over and over and day by day by day, is my relationship with God the where, the way and how he wants me to have it with him? And that demands that we actually take inventory of how we're treating others in our heart, in our, mi- our heart, our minds, or with our speech and beyond. The absence of love, truly on the opposite side of that coin, demonstrates that God's love and his presence is not in that person. So take that test. Please don't leave here. Please don't brush these kind of statements off as Scott's just trying to control people's lives or Scott's being a hypocrite. Actually look at the text of Scripture, prove whether it's true, decide for yourself, am I in relationship with God or am I close to him because I refuse to build a bridge to somebody that I have had a deep and and broken relationship with. So then he says, God can't be seen. Jesus we saw, the Holy Spirit's presence we can feel and sense, but when he talks about God the Father, we can't see him. And he's making a point here. It's easy, it should be easier to love what we can see than what we can't see. Right? If, I, if there's some person, some name out there, and I go, I have no idea who that person is. There's a name there. I don't know who they are. It's, isn't it much easier to love somebody you actually see, you're in connection with, relationship with, you pass in the hallway or whatever it is, It's much easier to love a person you can see than a God you can't see. So, if we say, I want to love God, then we've got to do the easier part first, even. I got to love people I can see. I got to show and demonstrate I'm called to love that person I can see. So, his love must be seen in and through believers. Again, I don't think this is optional. If we actually say, You're Lord of my life, we have to do the things that he says. And he says to love others. So loving others is not optional. His love must be seen in us. As in our actions, in our conduct, in our desire for the great benevolence that we extend to other people in our lives. Refusing to love the way God loves robs the world of his existence and his proof that should be in us. People ought to walk into any church any place they know a Christian is, and they ought to be able to say, I can experience the love of God through that person. I may not believe in what they say. I, don't, I think they're wackos and kooks or this, that, the other thing, whatever it may be, but they ought to go, wait a minute. That person, you can't ever get them to stop loving me, to stop wanting the very best for me. I treat them like the shoe and the dirt underneath my shoe, and they still just keep expressing love. The world ought to see Christ, ought to see God in our undefeatable benevolence that we extend to the world. The capacity to love, this agape kind of love we see in the New Testament, does not come from the human nature but from the Holy Spirit. Ah, whew, I don't have to do this in my own strength. You don't have to do this in your own strength. We get to rely on the power and presence of the Holy Spirit to say, Lord, I would treat this person this way. I need your strength to treat them your way. Please, Lord, give me the strength to treat them the way you want me to treat them. Because I can't do it on my own. Surrender to God. Let his spirit so fill and permeate our life and our walk and our existence with him that we always crucify the flesh and walk in the Spirit. We, it, it's a promise, and it's a good thing that we don't have to try and love people on our own strength. In our human efforts, we will fail virtually every time. They'll do something that we finally go, that crossed the line, that's too much, I can't accept that, I've got to walk away. That's the very moment we've got to turn to the Holy Spirit and say, now I need you more than ever to help me love another in your spirit. Believers love the lost. In addition to loving one another, this brotherly love that's supposed to happen in the fellowship of Christian community, believers are to love the lost and the unbelieving people in the world by actually declaring that Jesus sent his son, his only son, only begotten son, 
into the world to save them. It's not loving to know somebody needs to hear the gospel and the Holy Spirit's prompting you to share the gospel and then go, meh, not my job. We really should love the world enough to say, God loves you. He died for you. I mean, there's all kinds of evangel evangelistic kind of approaches to the unbeliever and to the hostile and those kind of things you can do. Plenty of resources out there. But we, should, we shouldn't refrain from telling the world that needs Christ that they need Christ. Because this might be their last breath. And if they, if they perish without that knowledge then we have failed to love them the way God has called us to. So yeah, we have to love our family, and we have to love the church, the church family, but we're called to love the world enough to at least say, you know, how's your relationship with God? Do you know where you're spending eternity? Do you consider yourself a good person? Is that goodness going to be accepted by God when he judges us? All kinds of ways we can have a conversation. But we should pray that the Lord will give us the speech and the confidence and the boldness that we don't have on our own to engage in a conversation that's uncomfortable with unbelievers. So if anyone claims to love God but hates his brother, he's a liar. Of course, we've covered that. Can't truly love God. Just keep that in your, in your notes there. A true love of God is expressed by keeping his commandments, which John says aren't burdensome. These command, you know, in the New Testament, we have just a couple of commandments. Mostly, I mean, there's all kinds of things. Actually, a higher level of responsibility to God than the Old Testament. But if we love God and we love others, we pretty much got it covered. Pretty much got it covered. All those sins of the Old Testament, all those things that you can define, you know, the Ten Commandments and all that. You know, as Jesus himself said, if you love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, body, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself, you got it covered. And I trust Jesus knows what he's talking about. If we do those two things, we've got it covered. His commandments are not burdensome. Love God, love others. Simple. Or simple to say. Harder to do. All right, and then he goes on and says, you know, we got a couple minutes here to finish off. A couple less things, or, or uh, less things, a, a couple things that won't require quite as much time to cover. He says, Paul writes to the Thessalonians and says, aspire to lead a quiet life and mind your own business. You might be saying, I thought, didn't you just tell me that you're in all up in my business right now, you know, uh, telling me how I'm supposed to live and love and all these things? Well, Paul says, you know, he says, as you do these things in a sanctified life, aspire to live a quiet life and mind your own business. When, it, when the situation's call, situation calls for it. Now, in everything, you have to realize, and I won't, probably can't get into all this today, everything requires kind of a balance. You know, you kind of have to have a balance. There's times when you need to speak, and there's times when you need to be quiet. There you go. We gotta recognize where those things are at. Right? Aspire to live a quiet life. He doesn't mean never speak. He doesn't mean never challenge somebody when they need to be rebuked or exhorted or con you know, convicted of certain things. But we've got to have a balance, okay? There's an there's a idiom out there or whatever that I've held on to for a long time, and whether or not it's always applicable or not, I don't know. But, you know, there's some people who have to say something and others that have something to say. You know, you want to kind of always check yourself. Am I the person who always has something to say? Or do I have something to, that needs to be said? Um, and so... You know, there's got to be a balance in how we are in, interacting with other people. So sanctified believers, Paul, is not, there's no interpretation here or, or flavoring by my part. Sanctified believers are instructed to lead a quiet life. That means, I think, in a variety of ways, our boss at work just doesn't really think anything negative about us, right? We don't, we don't do, well, they're, they're always late, they're always complaining, they're always this, they're always that. Oh my gosh, I can't believe I have to deal with Scott coming into work again today. I'd like to get rid of this guy, but I don't know how. No, we should live a quiet life. Like, if, if we're not doing anything wrong, we can be invisible. Or if we're doing, always doing our best, because we always want to do our best, great. Let, let the quiet life just be, well, there's Scott, went over there working, and he, can I just count on him? He's just doing what he's supposed to do, right? Not this complainer, not this person who's always a distraction, always the squeaky wheel that needs more and more and more grease. We're called to live a quiet, 
and peaceable life. And because that instruction is because we believers, sanctified believers, are always making God their highest priority. Now, that doesn't mean we never leave our prayer closet. Doesn't mean we never, you know, walk away from reading Scripture. We go out and engage in the world, but if God is our highest priority, and we're asking God, how can I live and interact with every human being that comes across my path today, then I'm called to allow him to use me in every situation. Something to pray about, something to think about. God, of course, is to be the, actually the higher priority than our family. In the Greek, he even says, hate your family in relation to how you're supposed to love God. You probably have all read this. If anyone comes to me and does not hate me, or hate his, fa- I'm sorry, hate his father and mother and wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, his own life, he cannot be his disciple, Jesus' disciple. Now, hate here doesn't mean you want the worst for them and you want to see them go to hell or you want to uh, separate from them forever. No, it just says God has got to be entirely different than every other relationship. Then we can properly build a relationship with everybody else. But God comes first in those things. God is to be higher than our vocational aspirations. We're to provide for our families, but hey, workaholism is a sin too. If you are completely consumed by all of your work life, there's no time for family, there's no time for God, there's no time for church, that's not, I don't think, fitting into this live a quiet and peaceable life kind of thing. Okay? God is higher than all of those. And some of us are retired or have more free time. I think that also falls into the same category. God is to be higher than sports and hobbies and leisure time. I don't know if I invented a new word here or not, but playaholism, right? You're addicted to leisure and sports and play and all that. God has got to be higher than that, and then we put that into the proper perspective afterward. Time for work, time for play, time for family, time for church, but God is always the highest priority of them all. Sanctified believers value rest and bring health to their spiritual, emotional, and physical lives. How's your schedule doing? Are you busy all week long? No time for anything? Sanctified believers value rest. God gave his chosen people one day and rest in seven. Somehow we, in our culture, expanded it to two days rest in seven, but most of us don't rest, right? We got to kind of value rest. Our, our spirits need it. Our physiological bodies need it. Our emotions need some time of rest. That's why God gave it to man from the very beginning of creation. You need a day of rest. We need to value that. That's easier to do when we're living a quiet and peaceable life and minding our own business. Sanctified believers guard their tongues and their speech. So I kind of already alluded to, you know, personal silence honors God. Scripture talks about the silent person with a lot of reverence, someone who rarely speaks. A lot of reverence for that, okay? Because, you know, you even sound really wise when you almost say nothing, right? So we, we got to kind of guard our speech and recognize sometimes God will be far more honored if I cut it off than speak. Again, Balance. We all have to speak. We all have to engage. But we got to sometimes ask God, where do you want me to speak and where should I be more silent or reserved in my speech? Sanctified believers have peace and confidence in the Lord and will acquiesce and comply as appropriate to honor God without violating his commands. That's a big one. I mean, lots of words. Okay. We have peace in God. And so sometimes we're called, nah, you know, this, again, this is a situation I might insert myself into, and other times you go, hmm, you know what? If God wants to do something, he might want to use somebody else this time. I'll just pull out of this one. I'll just stand back and let others maybe take that one, unless God calls me to it, and then I'll, of course, engage. We never want to violate God's standards in the things he's called us to, but consider and pray about our actions. Do I need to, or should I refrain from certain things? Sanctified believers work with their own hands 
so as to not be a burden to others, Paul says. He'll talk about this again. You know, if a man will not work, neither shall he eat kind of thing. You work with your own hands so that you're not a burden to others because when we start becoming a burden to others, wherever possible, now we recognize even in Scripture there are beggars who could not work and they needed a hand up or hand out kind of thing, right? But we, we're, if we have the capacity to, we're called to work and provide for ourselves and men are called to provide for their families so that nobody goes, well, that lech, you know, he just always, always pulling, never giving, and he clearly has the capacity to give, or clearly has a capacity to feed his family, but he's just, he's just not doing it, right? That's not leading a quiet life, a peaceable life, and it's not really minding our own business, because we're kind of always demanding that somebody pick up our slack, literally. All right, lastly here. Walking properly before unbelievers. A lot of what I've communicated to you this morning is about how to live first for yourself in relationship to God, and then sort of in that brotherly love, mostly kind of in the church and in your own personal family. But lastly, I believe he talks about walking properly before unbelievers, because sanctified believers are aware of how their actions and their words influence unbelievers. We should be aware. I'm going to go into this restaurant. I'm going to go into this grocery store. I'm going to go into the, I'm going to go attend this play or movie or whatever. And we should be aware of how our conduct affects other people. If you guys know me at all outside of church, you probably recognize about 80% of the time I've got on some kind of Christian logo apparel. I got a creation museum hat. I've got it. Sometimes I got a shirt that has a, those three nail crosses on it. I've got something that kind of lets people know that I'm a believer. And about at least half the time, I've got something I'm out there. Just like if you were to, how, I mean, some of you, I won't ask you to raise your hands, but if you like, I love to put this Christian bumper sticker on my car, but I can't do that because of the way I drive. Or you wear the Christian apparel, you know, Jesus loves you and this, that, and the other thing, and then you're just the most horrible person to be around. How is that representing Christ in the world? We've actually got to represent him in a way that he would have us to represent him. And so whether it's you tell people I'm a believer, act like one. You wear some logo or some gear that's apparelled for Christ, then act like you're a representative of the kingdom of God and how we treat others, okay? Because the world is watching. And if you do something at work, you do something at gym, you do something at retirement home, whatever it is, you do it, and people go, oh, he's a believer? No way. You don't want that said. God certainly doesn't want that said about believers. Sanctified believers always value their personal witness. Value it. I want to... I never want to cut myself off at the knees and say, well, I can't witness to that person. They just watch me do this. Boy, I mean, if you do something and you need to go apologize, please make sure you do it and tell them why you're apologizing. I feel terrible about it. I should have never done it. I know I offended you. I know I hurt you. And I certainly don't want a broken relationship. But above all things, I want you to know I love God and that's not the way he wants me to treat you. Take ownership for it. And give God the glory for your willingness to be a humble, repentant person before somebody. Sanctified believers will lovingly share their faith, as I already mentioned, wherever appropriate. I don't think it's always appropriate. I don't think it's always appropriate to stand in the bank line or whatever and go, Do you know Jesus? You know, are you going to hell? I mean, I don't know that it's always, always, always appropriate. You just, some people do, and that's and that that's their gift. But when the opportunity arises, when you feel your spirit the Holy Spirit prompting you and convicting you say, say something to that person. Say it. And ask God before you walk into the bank, before you start pumping gas, before you go to the movie theater or whatever, God, is there someone you want me to have a connection with today? If so, please make it known and please let me speak your words to them. I think that's all we have to do to get started with it. Maybe in doing so, you'll become a powerful evangelist but you've got to start somewhere if you're not already doing it. All right, so I don't, as I said, this is pretty thick, 
right? I don't expect you to kind of memorize everything Scott said today, and you know, statistically you'll remember about 10% or less or whatever. But there's some, there's some really important components here. We gotta have brotherly love if we call ourselves a Christian. We gotta represent Christ in all of our conduct well. And we wanna walk in the spirit because it's not just not doing evil, wicked, sinful things, it's actually doing good things for other people and good things for our relationship with God and all of that combines to good things for our own self. So I hope you'll take some of that with you. Okay, as we go, that's what I believe is a sanctified life. Not committing sins and not omitting the things that we're called to do. Let's pray. Father God, we just want to declare that we want, by your Spirit, Lord God, to be sanctified. I pray that every person here who has a relationship with you will not hear the words of a pastor speaking and preaching, but they'll hear the words of the Holy Spirit speaking to each individual heart saying, this is the way, walk in it. Set aside those things that are indicative of our former life and walk forward, walk worthy of your calling. Walk in full obedience with your Holy Spirit, Lord God. Let us refrain from committing things in our lives that you disapprove of and let us always be responsive to your Spirit and do the things you're calling us to. Lord, I believe there's no greater responsibility than to extend love to the kingdom of God and those in the body of Christ, Lord. Convict us, Lord God, rebuke us, and also give us your power by your spirit to love others when our flesh says, no way, I can't go past this point. Take us past that point and build a loving relationship. Restore, rebuild, rejuvenate, Lord God, by the power of your spirit. If we surrender to you, and I pray that we all would do that very thing in Jesus' name. Amen. amen. All right, we do have prayer teams up front if you want prayer. And by the way, it is Happy Mother's Day if that hasn't been extended to you. Mothers, we have a gift for you in the back or anybody who thinks you fall into categories like that. In the back, we just want you to have a wonderful and blessed day. See you next time.